Good morning, and thank you all for joining us for the kickoff of our Career Readiness Series. I'm Jean-Marie Neely, Vice Dean for Advancement for the School of Arts and Sciences, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Laura Alber, CEO of Williams-Sonoma. Laura is a member of the college class of 1990. As an undergrad at Penn, she majored in psychology and minored in anthropology. Laura, thank you so much for joining us so early on a Saturday morning. Laura has been CEO of Williams-Sonoma since 1995. In that role, she manages one of the leading retailers of kitchenwares and home furnishings. The company has 625 brick and mortar stores and distributes to more than 60 countries with many familiar brands, including Pottery Barn, West Elm, and Rejuvenation. The company is also the only home furnishings retailer on Fortune's Change the World 2020 list, which honors over 50 companies from around the world for their positive social impact through execution of their core business strategies. I know that Laura is particularly proud of that accomplishment. Laura is also a wonderful volunteer for Penn, serving as both a member of the university's board of trustees and as an overseer for the School of Arts and Sciences. Now let's get started. Laura, when you graduated, you had no job, no money and no connections, and yet you packed up and moved to San Francisco not sure what would happen when you got there. Tell us about your journey from the Penn campus to CEO's office of Williams-Sonoma. I ended up um, actually uh, just interviewing for an admin job and I got the interview and I was very excited and I was gonna get the job. And um, I talked to my parents and they said, you know, that's great, but why don't you ask them for a career? And I was really mad at them because I was so excited that I landed a job. But that extra sentence in that career conversation where I looked at the person who was interviewing and said exactly what my father told me to say, which was, you know what, I really want to work here. I'll do anything. But if you could help me get on a career path, I would appreciate it. And I'll, I'll, I'll work really hard and I'll never let you down. I remember looking right in the eye and delivering that, that last pitch and the person looked at me and I changed from an admin to a trainee. That was a big deal because I think I was a little naive to think you could just do whatever and end up wherever. And, um, you know, having, I think it's, you know, maybe there's more movement now, but maybe there's not. So at least there was a, a way for me to go from where I started to other jobs. You know, I mean, that first role um, was a great place to learn, uh, but I, I never really completely connected with my work at The Gap. Um, I wasn't as interested in clothing and particularly that type of clothing as a lot of people there. And I was okay at it. I, I don't think I was great. I was okay. I got a few promotions. And then we moved to LA because my husband was getting his MBA. And I just, you know, I, I always thought I would have my own business. So I, I wasn't too concerned about what I was, who I was working for. And I had these fledgling businesses always on the side, both at Penn. And then also when I was at The Gap, I had a little business on the side too. And I, I sort of thought one of those things would be what I ended up doing. So I went and I took a job actually that there was a woman who I had worked kind of, I'd known of at The Gap and she was running this company, Contempo Casuals. I don't, you guys are too young, but Contempo Casuals was a juniors like wet seal type thing. And I went to work there and talk about not being good at it. I really, I mean, I think at one point I got written up because I wasn't, I was, I really wasn't very good at it. Um, I didn't understand that consumer and it was really devastating. I was super worried. I, you know, I put my head down, they transferred me to white shirts and I was able to do white shirts better than I did, you know, the fashion stuff. But that was a good lesson in don't just follow a person. The person actually got fired after I'd been there two months. So she, she brought me in and then she left and I was left holding the bag. Literally, I thought, you know, God, my corporate career is over. I'm going to get fired. And, you know, it's a good lesson and don't ever follow a person. You have to go to a great company because you never know when that person falls out of favor. And if you're with them, you're right out of favor too. And so, um, you know, you see this a lot. I see this a lot where people leave our company to go work for an old boss. I don't really ever see it working out very well. Um, it's about, you know, your, your connection to that product line or that company not necessarily the immediate boss, although the immediate boss can make a very big difference in your day to day. 
I don't think it makes that big of a difference um, as it relates to your career. Um, so anyway, long story short, we finished up there. He got his MBA. We moved back to San Francisco and I started looking for another job again. And I ended up at Williams-Sonoma. And um, the rest of sort of history went very fast from there because I immediately knew that I had found my home. It was like lights on, so exciting. Everyone there was a chef or an architect, you know, a design person, so smart, group of incredibly talented people building Potter Barn, which was really small at the time. I think it was something like $60 million. And Jean Marie, when you said 1995, that's when I started. I'm sorry, I should have caught that in my bio. I became CEO in 2010. I started in 1995 at Williams. I thought that was a long time ago, Laura. <laughs> time ago. And um, so, you know, I guess the next career story that's relevant is that I, I came in as a senior buyer and I did catalog, which wasn't popular at the time. It's now, you know, DTC, which I got put in the right place. And my boss, you know, she was building her family and she had four boys and she had got pregnant four times in a row. And each time I got the chance to hold down the fort. And, uh oh, my dog's barking. Um, this is the, the perils of Zoom, right? Um, hold on one second. Stop, stop, stop. So I got to hold down the fort and I got more responsibility and she was so thankful, not competitive, thankful um, that I would do that. And so I don't think I would have ended up being the director of catalog so quickly if I hadn't had that opportunity. And that was a really, you know, pivotal choice for her and for me, because I could have been angry that I was doing all the work and not getting paid. She could have felt like I was trying to usurp her power. None of that happened. Um, and we both had a really good attitude about it. And then I became director of catalog. Now, that was probably the biggest promotion of my life is becoming the director of catalog. I remember thinking, I've made it because that was when I finally got to have my own business versus being someone's assistant, you know, or being a buyer in a division, but I actually ran the unit. And that gave me so much um, encouragement to be myself at work, to be innovative. And then I started thinking about new businesses. I got pregnant in 1998 with my first um, daughter. And when I did, I wrote the business plan with a few women there for Pottery Barn Kids. And, you know, that's a very big business today. And I wrote that plan. It was not popular. And what got the attention of the CEO, who was Howard Lesser at the time, is no one liked the plan. They kept saying, that's one room of the house. You know, you're delirious, pregnant. You're, you know, this is going to be super dangerous for the company. It's going to be a safety hazard. Focus on your real job. We don't even want to hear about this. But I, we didn't give up. We kept working on it. We actually sent out a ton of packets um, of design overseas and got the products back. And on one day, we literally set, had the guys who um, moved the cars, move all the cars out of the garage and we set up a store. And I went upstairs and I grabbed the CEO and said, will you please come downstairs for five minutes? And he walked down and said, a few, you know, swore a little bit, like couldn't believe what we did and looked me in the eye and said, I can't, I can't stop you. You have my permission because we are so tenacious in putting this together. And I think he just finally had to shut us up. And so we launched Potter Run Kids. It was the most successful launch the company had ever had. Um, that was a key, another key pivot point because it got people's attention, real, building real business, you know, adding real value, doing something that hadn't been done before. And Howard was an entrepreneur and loved that. I later became president of the company, took on supply chain versus taking on other brands because he wanted to see me do the operations. And then unfortunately, you know, Howard had been diagnosed with cancer he had brought in a few other CEOs who didn't make it very long with him. He brought them in and then they'd leave, brought them in, then they'd leave. You can read between the lines there. You can also read the history. But finally, um, in, he was going to make me CEO in 2007, but then the 2009 crash happened. I waited through that. And then in 2010, he finally made me CEO. And until the day that he did, he actually 
made me believe I would never get the job. He interviewed in front of me. He brought in other people. He never gave me the wink wink. And he just kept me um, working really hard to get that job. So that's my career. That's a great story, Laura. And um, know how, knowing you how I have for so long, um, I'm not surprised by your tenacity. So it, it makes me wonder, um, thanks to COVID-19, we've all had to be flexible and adapt to changing circumstances. And you've shared a little bit about this, but I'm just wondering, what role does resiliency play in your day-to-day -day personal and professional life? I think it's a big deal. You know, I mean, there's so many things that come at you, right? And I do believe in um, the idea that it's not what happens, it's how you handle it. And so there's always something you can do. And at this point in my career, I'm thinking about my bigger impact versus the impact on me. I'm thinking about, you know, when the, when the pandemic hit, our stakeholders, our employees, the communities where we work and how we can make sure we're doing the best job for them. And I'm very proud to tell everyone that when it first hit, I mean, now it's clear that home furnishings are one of the areas that do well during the shutdown because everybody's at home. But that wasn't clear in the beginning. We, you know, our stores were hard shut down, sales were real tough, and we made the decision to keep paying our associates. We we're the only retailer in the mall that did that besides Apple. I mean, of course, Apple, richest company in the world, they're gonna pay their associates. But everyone else was furloughing and you know, doing all these things. And we said, we're gonna keep going. We ran the cash flow to see how long we could make it if there was zero sales in the stores and we paid them. And we made this decision to pay them. And I'll tell you the, the gratitude from these associates, Jean Marie, and the, um, you know, them paying us back with just hard work and their tenacity is uh, been this virtuous cycle where we, you know, we're doing well, they're so innovative. They figured out how to do virtual design chat, working from home, all these things that we've never done before because they were so grateful and they kept working and they innovated. And that's why we got on that list the change the world list because we were one of the few people who made that decision that was very brave at the time. So Laura, as you look back at your time at Penn, is there, are there any lessons that you would take from inside the classroom or outside the classroom that are serving you well today? Um, I think a liberal arts education really prepares you well for these generalist business jobs. And a lot of general jobs, you know, any managerial job because you're dealing with so many different things. You know, you have to write memos. So of course the writing, really important. There's always quantitative work in anything, any job you do, right? Um, and then of course the people side. Um, my anthropology work, you know, relates perfectly to home furnishings. I mean, think about that strange connection. Um, you know, and you never know what that class is gonna be that you're gonna take that's gonna help you later. And of course, you know, just all that critical thinking that goes on at Penn is so good for you. I'd say, you know, I also learned as much outside the classroom. It took me about senior year to figure out all the good speakers and show up for them. I wish I had figured that out freshman year. But, you know, in the early years, I think making friends and being social is so important. And learning how you know to navigate that that big urban campus that's beautiful but also can be quite daunting and meet people and now i can only imagine people learning how to build relationships on zoom and how do you do that those things putting yourself out there taking a risk and having it work out builds confidence and then when you get into the business world it's that extra umph to be able to walk into your boss's office and say hey i want to put my hand up for that you know, or yeah, I'll go, I'll go out for a drink and, and with you, thank you for inviting me. And all those different things that you learn in college, it's the same stuff. It's, you know, I think it's, it just, it's the same when you're in the business world. Thank you, Laura. So this is a question that I think will be particularly interesting to our students. Um, you hire about 35 interns a year, many of them from Penn, and thank you for that. Some of them go on to get jobs with you. What makes an applicant stand out in your mind when you're looking at these interns and employees? Yeah, so, you know, we get a ton of applications um, from all over the country and sometimes overseas, which is harder because the visas, but we, 
we get a ton and we have a lot of readers read the the resumes i you know most of the internships are generalized we do have tech engineering internships too and that goes through a different path but to answer your question about the generalized ones you know we're looking for people who have retail interest so if they're in a club or they even just worked in sales in the mall we love that we love seeing that with leadership with a good gpa and focus and <clears throat> those resumes stand out and then of course the interview you know i know how hard it is and you're in, you're applying to a lot of different jobs but you got to take the time if you get that interview from that recruiter to to really know about the company know why you want to work there have some facts so that it doesn't feel like it could be any company when they call you those kids you know end up making it to the hiring managers and i interview some of the kids myself cuz i think it's so fun to see all the top talent and the kids who then come in we have about a i'd say 70% come back to us we hire them and they come back you know we've done a better job with selection to be able to choose the kids who are likely to come back we've stopped taking the person who wants to parlay our internship into somebody else's job we want the kids who want to work for us so that's a key part of the interview process is knowing are you likely to want to work for us and just even down to the brass tacks of California or New York you know we have two big offices West Elms in New York California Sam, um, is a William Sillman Pottery Barn brands and so if they if they want to live in Kentucky well that's probably not going to be a great intern because we don't have anything in Kentucky so we're very careful on the screen but then you know we want the kid who really um, has added value and this year we did a four week virtual internship. I didn't know if that would work. Well, it did. And we got some of the best yields of kids who we both offered and accepted this year ever. So we we're getting better at the selection and um um you know, I think so many times particularly, you know, high performing kids at Penn think that the mundane job isn't relevant. The working, you know, at the sandwich shop job, the working in the retail shop job. I'm telling you, we love that. And I'm not the only one. CEOs love to see that real that's the work we did. There were we didn't even have internships. Mm -hmm. So, don't be afraid to really talk about that, and make that a big deal and even put it in the cover letter. I th I think that's great advice, Laura, and as I was listening to you, um it reminded me of when students are applying to Penn and they have to do their why Penn essay and they really have to know the culture of the university, why it's a good fit for them and why they're a good fit for Penn. So um, I think it's really just an extension of that when you're looking at what kind of corporate environment you want to be in. T. Marie, do you, do you think we should, um, in terms of timing, See if anybody has any questions. Yeah, we're keeping it. We're keeping an eye on that, Laura. So no worries. But I do encourage everyone: if you have a question for Laura, please type it into the the Q and A, or you can raise your hand at this point, and we'll be happy to take your questions. We we still have a few more to go through, but would love to engage the students in this conversation because we want this to be as helpful and as meaningful to you as it can possibly be. So, Laura, here's a topic that I, I know. Um, I know you feel strongly about, and I've always admired your energy and the passion that you bring to your work at Williams Sonoma. And I'm I'm just reminded of an event we did at West Elm, um, boy, I guess it was two years ago now, and where you really made a big pitch for everyone in the room to consider a career in retail. So tell our students why retail. I think it's the best um, job you can have. It's very tangible, and uh, it's always going to be relevant. People are always going to buy clothing. They're always going to buy things for their home. And product is so interesting. In the home world, there's always something new, new cooking techniques, um, the science of cooking, the science of food. And it's very stimulating to work on that um, product. At the same time, retail brings you all over the world. Products are sourced everywhere. So if you like international business and you always thought you'd go into international relations or um, you just like traveling, you get to go all over the world and see these incredible um, craftspeople and um, 
production that's happening in different areas and the communities that do the work and how you can improve their lives by conscious capitalism in their communities. It's super satisfying. At the same time, you know, as I said, you, you get this great analytical and now with tech playing such a big role in retail, um, this other side of it, that's very relevant to, uh, you know, a lot of people who work for us go on to work at Uber or other tech companies because we're, you know, right now we're 75% e-commerce. We were before the pandemic 60, but we've had such a tech um, focus. And so you're not this, you know, off just working on product selling in brick and mortar, but retail is all about social media now and CRM and ad buying and working with Google. And when you're in the, so there's so much richness to the work that if you are in love with a liberal arts education, I'm telling you, you're gonna love retail. And also it is such a great career for women. Um, you see many more women make it up the ranks of retail than probably any other career. When you look at CEOs and I think that's, you know, it's real. So it's a relevant comment, right? And so um, I, I just think it's a very exciting career and um, you know, you can start a business. It's, you know, you see a lot of people who work in retailers start businesses. Mm -hmm. um, it's, that's something that's also doable. So if you're thinking, well, I want to go work for someone and then I'm going to go to business school and I'm going to start my own retail company. It's a great place to go, you know, in the beginning to work for a company that's established. So Laura, here's a question that's just come up um, and probably um, inspired by comments that you just made. And um, now that we're in this pandemic, as you imagine a post pandemic world, do you think that more and more companies will shift to a hybrid in office virtual landscape? Do you see virtual work becoming more of a thing at Williams Sonoma and other places? I think that there will be more hybrid. Um, I, I think retail is still a very tactile career. I mean, I went in yesterday, reviewed product, sat in sofas, you know, looked at prints. It's what we do. That's hard to do in Zoom. You miss a lot of the detail. And so, you know, I, I also think that culture is not built virtually. I think there is some work in some jobs that you can do virtually, but I, I, I will tell you that I think a more satisfying reality is the in-person. Um, there's, you know, some companies are gonna be out for a while. Um, some are all out, all in, and then the hybrid. I, I imagine more hybrid to your point, Jean Marie. Mm -hmm. But for William Sonoma, you know, we're not even 10% in the office yet. It's building as we go into peak Christmas time. Um, but I think, you know, it'll probably only be 10% out of the office when the pandemic is over, mm -hmm. just honestly. Mm -hmm. So an, another question I think inspired by our current circumstances is what advice do you have for students who need to present themselves virtually for internships or for new jobs? I would I'd say be passionate, um, you know, make sure that you're telling the interviewer what you can do for them. And, you know, sometimes you get these informational interviews through somebody you know, assume every one of those people could possibly hire you. So you got to think about how to do the ask, which is, you know, can you give me your advice? Can you, can you tell me about your career? And when that's all over, say, God, you are so inspiring to me. Do you think I could, is there any way I could possibly work for you? Ask, just ask. The worst thing they're going to say is, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't expect that today. I mean, I'll get back to you. You know, likely they're going to they're going to be thinking it if they like you anyway. Mm -hmm. So you've got to don't let any of those um, informational interviews get away. I'd also say, you know, just be careful of sounding like the person who has no clue of what you want to do. You may feel that way. My guess is you have a better sense than you actually present. I would come in and say, I do a little bit more of the pitch that says if you get the informational interview at William Sonoma. I don't want to hear that maybe you want to work for Goldman too. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I don't really want to hear that. I want to hear that you say, you know what? I never thought I'd be interested in retail, but I love your products. I really am inspired by what you guys are doing. This is what I want to do. I'm so, how do I get an internship? 
-hmm. And I think what I can do is I can bring you my skills, even though I've been a graphic designer, I, that's going to parlay perfectly into your world, whatever you've done. But don't be so, you know, what do you think I should do if you get an informational interview? I think it's fine to go to a career counselor and ask them what you think they should do. But if you get a hiring manager on the phone, you might want to just tell them that you want to work for them mm -hmm. and that you, that you love their company because you, you could squ squander these opportunities that seem lax to you or relaxed or they know your parents or they know somebody's gotten you this connection. Those are really good ins. Okay. And so you, you want to be thinking about selling yourself, not just wondering what the company is going to do for you. If it's too much about, well, tell me about, you know, how I can grow my career. It's more about, look, here's my skills. Here's, and you guys have a lot more skills than you think you do. You're probably all social media experts, right? So Laura, we, we have um, time for one more question from a student who is asking, how you maintain your work-life balance? I mean, carefully, I guess, but um, sometimes it's out of balance. It's not, you know, some days it's all work and other days, you know, you take the day off. I, I, I'd say if you love what you do, um, it gives you a lot of energy. And, you know, if you're building something, endless energy. energy. So, and then, you know, you got to stay in shape. I, I mean, I'm a big believer in physical exercise, eating well, and that gives you, you know, that, that extra push that if you feel healthy and you're getting sleep, it's amazing what you can do. And building that resilience, Jean Marie, we talked about resilience. You know, if you're a runner, run in the rain. If you're a Peloton biker, turn it up. You know, I mean, you got to every time go a little extra hard. And I always think, you know, some of that exercise, which is uncomfortable, makes work easy. Mm -hmm. So there's Laura, a, the book, just one last thing, Corporate Athlete is a good thing to read. Good. That, that's, that, that's a good piece of closing advice. I also want to just give a shout out because I do know Laura for a long time that it helps when you have a supportive partner and she's got a terrific husband. So Ned, Ned is really great. Tell him I gave him a shout out. Oh, thank you. Uh, so Laura, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your advice with our students today. And I always enjoy talking with you and I just love your energy and your passion. So you got me all revved up and I will be thinking of you later when I'm on my Peloton bike. We're just <laughs> so fortunate to have alumni like you who are willing to give your time and energy back to Penn and to our students. And let me thank our students as well for joining us so early on a Saturday morning. It's early, I know it's early even here in Pennsylvania. I hope you'll stay for the rest of the College Career Readiness Program, beginning with the next session on the gift of a liberal arts education. You'll hear how our alumni have built on their liberal arts education to build successful careers in finance, law, and publishing. We posted the link for the next session in the chat box, but you can just stay here and you'll be automatically redirected to the next session. Laura, thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Take care. Take care.